Great. So, uh, Nora is going to be talking to us. Uh, well, Nora is a professional genealogist working with the North Tipperary Genealogy Centre for the last 28 years. She has a master's degree in the history of the family obtained from the University of Limerick. She has undertaken several local studies and published a number of articles in local publications. And Nora is going to be uh, focusing on the profile of Irish emigrants to New Zealand. It will outline the conditions in Ireland which forced the emigrants to seek a new life overseas. And the lecture will illustrate the outward passage and the conditions of the long voyage to New Zealand and give a glimpse of how the Irish emigrants settled in their new homeland. Now most Irish people have experienced chain migration within their own families, so I think this particular lecture is going to be of great relevance to everybody here in this room. So please give a warm welcome to Nora Gleason Omar. That's great, thank you very much, Morris. Now, Morris is going to be my technical assistant uh, this morning. And am I clear at the back? Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Okay? That's perfect. Now, I would like to just to reiterate a uh, welcome to you all here this morning uh, to a very series of lectures for the Gleason Gathering, and I hope you enjoy your stay in Tipperary. Before I start my presentation, just to give you a little bit of information about the North Tipperary Genealogy Centre. The Genealogy Centre is located on the ground floor of the Heritage Centre, which is based in Kickham Street here in Nina, and it's run under the auspices of the Tipperary County Council. I have been, as Maura said, the genealogist there for the last 28 years. The centre, ha we have uh, computerised and digitised all the genealogical records for, pertaining to North Tipperary, and we also have them online at Roots Ireland. And uh, details of, there's a similar centre to ours in most counties in Ireland, and details of all the centres are available on the tourism stand at the back of the hall. And also, I will be available over the weekend and next week in the Genealogy Centre. And if I can be of any help to anybody, I will gladly assist. We don't have a facility where people can undertake uh, research themselves. We actually undertake the research for you. Um, and over the years, I have to say that we have undertaken research for thousands of the uh, clients and connected them with their uh, Irish ancestors here in North Tipperary. Now, just to my presentation. As Morris has said, my presentation is on Irish chain migration to New Zealand. Emigration has been a dominating feature of Irish life for almost four centuries and has left us with an unmistakable legacy. And it is estimated that 8 million people left Ireland between 1800 and 1921. The Irish diaspora is to be found in every corner of the world. Now, what is chain migration? Chain migration is the process where people from a particular area all tend to migrate to the same area. It is also the process where people, where the process where relatives who have previously migrated to a new country sponsor their family to migrate to that same country. Thus the term chain migration. Chain migration from Ireland to New Zealand was prevalent in the mid to late 19th century. Irish migrants to New Zealand fitted into four major distinct immigration categories. Those of single males, those of single females, married couples with children, and married couples without children. They represented different groups in terms of age and of their skill profile, as well as whether or not they had partners or whether or not they had dependents. How they approached their lives in New Zealand was very much governed by these matters. The distance from New Zealand, from Ireland to New Zealand, was 14,323 nautical miles. It was quite a long journey, and it took anything up to 90 days to get there, depending on the weather. Now we ask the question, why did the Irish people emigrate? Well, there were a number of reasons. Firstly, we had the Great Famine from 1845 to 1850. And not a lot of Irish people actually emigrated to New Zealand as a direct result of the famine. However, a huge number did emigrate to Australia and America. Then we had the land question in Ireland. Munster was undergoing a class collapse in the latter part of the 19th century. And as the subdivision of farms sharply diminished, 
the landless agricultural labourer ceased to exist as a class. The young male sons of small farmers had no hope of acquiring enough land to support a family and decided to emigrate to find a new life overseas. The majority of assisted migrants from Ireland were poor landless labourers. There were also major changes taking place in agriculture. There was a shift from tillage farming to cattle farming. There were huge advancements in industry and machinery which meant there was less labour required in the land. There was also less home industry. After the famine, the landlords were determined to clear their lands and in some cases willingly paid for their tenants' passage. So these were all what we call the push factors. Then we had the pull factors. The Irish were attracted by a range of financial subsidies and incentives, particularly assisted and nominated emigrant schemes. The discovery of gold in Australia in 1851 meant people from all over the world were emigrating there. Later, the, the discovery of gold in New Zealand encouraged them to move from Australia to New Zealand. They were also seeking a new life overseas. Then we asked the question, why did they specifically emigrate to New Zealand? First of all, the majority of free-paying emigrants to New Zealand, from Ireland to New Zealand, travelled first to Australia and worked in the gold mines there. And then, around the early 1860s, there was a recession in Australia, which forced the Irish to move on to New Zealand, where gold had been discovered around 1861 in the Otago region. And then in 1865, gold was discovered up around the west coast, around Thames in the Coromandel area, and they followed the gold up there. New Zealand was also a country with huge land grants. The landscape, climate and language was almost the same as Ireland. New Zealand was a new country with plenty of opportunity for those willing to work hard there. Now, there were two types of Irish emigrants to New Zealand, assisted emigrants and self-paying emigrants. The majority were assisted emigrants. The New Zealand companies offered assisted passage and free passage to organised settlements in New Zealand. By 1851, a large proportion of Auckland's population, 2,871 out of the 8,840, were of Irish background. The number of Irish emigrants began to rise sharply in the 1860s. Many emigrants were nominated by family members that were already there. On the west coast of New Zealand, where I just mentioned the gold mines were, there were twice as many Irish men as Irish women, mostly from Munster and mostly Irish Catholic. While the number of self-paying migrants were less than those of assisted, they were still a significant number, and again, very much drawn by the gold mines. The migrants who worked in the gold mines made up a lot of money there and bought up huge tracts of land in New Zealand and became progressive farmers. The New Zealand companies advertised free passage in the newspapers to entice people to migrate as they needed people to populate their new country. The next slide is just an advert from a paper dated the 14th of August 1839, and I'll just read a little bit of it from, for you. It says, Free Passage, Emigration to New Zealand. The directors of the New Zealand Land Company hereby give notice that they are ready to receive applications for a free passage to their first and principal settlement from mechanics, gardeners, and agricultural labourers being married not exceeding 30 years of age. Strict inquiry will be made as to qualifications and character. The company's emigrant ship will sail from England early in September and further particulars printed on. So you can see at times they were specific in the type of emigrant that they wanted. The next photograph is just shows you some of the emigrants saying their final goodbyes to their families and friends. The next photograph is are the uh, uh, picture of the emigrants waiting in Cove, which was back then known as Queenstown. The next one then, this is a typical emigrant ship of the 1850s. It was a, th a tree-masted wooden clipper ship. 
Now, many of these clipper ships were built in Canada, and of course, a lot of them later on in China to transport the tea. The clippers were a fast, faster sailing ship. They were built for speed and represented the pinnacle of sailing ship technology. The journey to New Zealand was long and often dangerous. As already mentioned, in the mid-1850s, the journey could take up to 90 days, including stopovers. In the 1880s, the New Zealand government introduced a postage subsidy to steamship companies to encourage the fast delivery of mail to New Zealand. This made the steamships more profitable, and then they began to carry the majority of immigrants. And of course, the advanced steamships were less reliant on wind, and they traveled at a constant speed. And again, they provided power and electric light for refrigeration and ventilation, which made the journey for the emigrants much more comfortable. The majority of Irish migrants to New Zealand boarded their ships at London, Plymouth and Glasgow, while those going to Australia would have boarded at Liverpool. Passengers embarked knowing that they were leaving their native land and loved ones, perhaps never to return. The next is a copy of a ticket dated 1907. Uh, the cost, it's a third class steerage passenger ticket, cost £17 on the Ionic ship from London to New Zealand. The luggage was not to exceed 15 cubic feet, and this was about the equivalent of two large suitcases, so 100 euros on Ryanair, I'd say. The daily allowance of water was uh, two, three quarts a day, which is six pints. One quart is two pints. Now, on the ticket on the left hand side, you probably can't read it there because it's very small. What it did um, advertise was the weekly allowance per adult. And I'll just read out a few. Um, it said one and a half pounds of Indian meal, one and a half pounds of mess pork, three and a half pounds of biscuits, three pounds of flour, a pound of rice, two pounds of potatoes, a half pound of peas, a pound of oatmeal, and so on and so on. However, underneath it also states that the master has the option of substituting all the above. Now, we all know the master did change all the above and that the steerage passengers did not get the advertised allowance. The sailing route to New Zealand was called the Great Circle. The ship sailed down around the Cape of Good Hope off the coast of Africa, stopping at Tenerife, Cape Town and Hobart. This route involved enormous risks of drifting icebergs and the wild seas generated frequent storms. The route required exceptional navigational skills as the slightest error could lead to a disaster. Many ships were lost when navigating the narrow path between King's Island and the and the southern tip of Victoria, which led to the west coast of Victoria being known as the Shipwreck Coast. The opening of the Suez Canal in 1869, which linked the Red Sea and the Mediterranean Sea, gave ships coming from Europe a shorter and faster and safer route. In 1914, the Panama Canal opened, which connected the Pacific Ocean and the Atlantic, and of course this gave them another alternative route. The New Zealand shipping companies used the Panama Canal when it opened in 1914, and Shaw and Savile ships used it two years later. Life at sea was uncomfortable and often dangerous, particularly for the passengers who tra travelled cheaply in steerage, which was the lowest deck and below the waterline. Storms were prolific in the South o Ocean. Steerage passengers slept in tiers of bunks, and they were provided with a straw mattress with no, but no bed linen. The bunks were cramped and the tables and stools occupied the spaces between the tiers. Steerage was divided into three compartments, single men to the uh, forward area, next to the crew quarters, single women were aft, and married couples in the middle. Hygiene was poor at the best of times and worse in stormy weather. When the hatches were battened down, the passengers on the lowest deck were confined without ventilation and light. Thus you can imagine the perfect conditions for the spread of disease. Scarlet fever and measles were common causes of death on board. 
Candles were restricted in case of fire. Lice and cockroaches were everywhere. Some of the men who were able to swim did so when they reached the tropics, or sometimes they were hosed down on deck by the sailors. However, the women were denied these luxuries. None of the passengers would have had any experience traveling on ships, thus most of them suffered with seasickness. And unfortunately, the ship's doctor was not able to offer much in the way of relief for the seasickness. Those paying their own way usually traveled second class. And of course, we know that the first class and second class passengers had quite a comfortable journey as they would have had their own cabin and a much better quality diet. The ships carried several hundred passengers and I have looked at many of the emigrant ships and I'm just going to give you one example of one. Journey time, 90 days in total. 750 passengers, 130 crew, also the following livestock to satisfy the dining needs for those traveling. 450 chickens, 200, 200 ducks, 100 sheep, 50 turkeys, a couple of lambs and a milking cow. Deaths at sea were tragically common. On this particular ship there were 54 deaths and that's 77.2% 7 of the 750 passengers. The deaths consisted of two adults, two children aged 7 to 10 years, 16 male children aged 1 to 7, 20 female children aged 1 to 7, 7 male children under 1 years of age, and 7 female children under 1 year. For the burials, the body was sewn in a piece of canvas or placed in a rough coffin put together by the carpenter on the ship and thrown overboard as quick as possible to avoid disease. When the ships arrived in New Zealand, the emigrants went their separate ways. Some met up with family if they had been sponsored by them. The Irish remained a visible community in New Zealand for some years they saw the importance of family nomination and chain migration. They were a huge supporters of the Irish Catholic Church. Within the cities, Irish Catholic neighborhoods arose around the churches. In Christchurch, for example, there was a disproportionate number of Catholics in the street near the cathedral. East Hamilton was known as Irish Town. But these neighborhoods were not exclusive to Catholics and they were never ghettos, nor ethnic enclaves, as they had been in North America. Irish populations were evident in some cities, such as Wonhunga in Auckland, Charlestown in Nelson, and Greymouth in Westland. However, by the early 20th century, it was hard to distinguish the Irish from the New Zealanders themselves as they had integrated so well into their new country. While the Irish were going to New Zealand while the Irish going to New Zealand were initially attracted to specific occupations such as gold mining, particularly in Otago and in the west, along the west coast, they worked at various other jobs, such as farming, building roads and railways. Some were pioneering businessmen setting up some of New Zealand's first hotels, bars and breweries. They were especially attracted to the police force and by the turn of the century, 40% of the New Zealand police force were of Irish Catholic descent. Some of the great police commissioners were just a few, John Brannigan, John Cullen and John O'Donovan. The Irish were also very involved in politics in New Zealand and helped to shape this new country. They continued their own Irish culture. From the 1860s, St. Patrick's Day was celebrated with sports, horse racing and dancing and drinking on the west coast of New Zealand. They also established the Hibernian Societies. The first was set up in 1869 in Greymouth. By 1921, there were 84 branches throughout the country. And these uh, 
branches were dedicated to cherishing the memory of Ireland and promoting the Irish Catholic faith. Those Irish migrants who did well for themselves did send home money to bring other family members and relatives to New Zealand. They also sponsored their neighbours and friends, thus continuing the chain migration. Money remitted to Ireland from New Zealand between 1870 and 1880 exceeded £130,000. Most of the Irish who emigrated to New Zealand did not return or visit their homeland again, but they did keep in contact with their families and relatives by letters. While the content of the immigrant letter must be viewed with caution, they did give us some insight as to what life was like in their new homeland. In their letters, they talked about farming, work, wages, family, friends, neighbours, the weather and the cost of items. Now, I'm just going to read you just a short extract from a letter written by a happy Irish migrant settled in New Zealand, and he writes this letter to his mother. My dear mother, I can't tell you how overjoyed I felt to get your long letter, given us all the news. Mary and me always have a cry when I get your letter. A man can make his fortune here very quick if he works hard. We are doing well, plenty of money now. Mary Burke done well for herself. She got a job in the shop and is now married to the shop owner. How is Paddy doing? James married last November to a girl from Nina. I had house room enough, but his wife preferred living on their own. Land is good here. We tend to mass when we can. The children are great. Remember me today and all the neighbours. Your dearest son, Michael. Now, I won't comment on all the spelling, but you can. I tried to pronounce some of them so you get the gist of it. Now, I would just like to say thank you all for listening to my lecture. Hope I have given you a brief synopsis of Irish chain migration to New Zealand and to bear in mind that this pattern of chain migration would have been replicated for most families from all areas throughout Ireland's history. Okay? No, thank you. Thank you. That's great, Nora. Thanks very, very much. Now, do we have a few questions for Nora? Hopefully not. Hopefully not, she says. <laughs> You're not going to get away that easy. I suppose, um, I just, sure. I just add there as well, just to say that um, my own family did emigrate and we have had chain migration for about, uh, I suppose, five generations from 1852 to date. Uh, and how did that happen in your own particular family? Um, was it mainly the 1850s? In the 1850s after the famine and attracted to the gold rush in Australia and then on to New Zealand. And did they find gold? Lots of it. <laughs> I didn't see any of it, but they forgot lots of it. Yeah. Did anybody else have ancestors that went out to um, uh, the gold rush, either in Australia or in America? We had one here, okay. And we have a couple of here back. I'm just going to bring down the mic. How do we access Nora and our services going forward after this? Um, I have some cards and that I will get, leave my cards on the table where you see trace your Irish roots at the back. You can pick up a brochure there and the details of the genealogy centre are there. And could I just, and I, um, I'm just not uh, going to correct just one thing that Mara said earlier about the poor law read books in Thurlis Library, just to say that they are, we have them computerized in the genealogy center for the last, I'd say, about maybe eight or ten years, and they are online on Roots Ireland for anybody that wants to access them. Oh, and they are also online recently by the library themselves. And that will connect the entire departments with Griffith's Federation, a time stamp. Great. Michael, question here. No, it's just a comment board on anything you mentioned there uh, of finding gold. Many of you might know there's a town in Arizona, it's now a ghost town. Gleason Town, uh, called after John Gleason from Upper Church Country, who emigrated there and found gold. And we had a, a family member here last night, I don't think he's here tonight, Willie Gleason. And um, if you just Google Gleason um, Town, 
you, 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 you read plenty about it. You see the jail, the sheriff's office, and the hospital. But they're all ghosts. Billions now falling down. The wind just going through them. So they did find the gold. Well, I suppose they did, and I suppose it was interesting if you read some of the letters and stuff back. The Irish people had the impression when they got a letter back and people spoke about when they were working in the gold mines, and from reading the letters, you get the impression that the Irish people are thinking they are finding these nuggets of gold as big as the phone here, whereas in actual fact, they were tiny little pieces, but it's just, and from a lot of the letters, I mean, I haven't time to, each of my slides warrant a presentation on their own. However, um, it's interesting, they are all the time with a lot of the letters making the comparison in their new country and their old country and what things cost and what they miss. But I mean, I haven't time to explain all of those. Was there a question from John? Yes. I was just have actually a question about the um, about Legion in, in Arizona. It's spelled with two E's. So we've got a two E's in Arizona. And it's also turquoise. They mine turquoise. So that was, that was a comment from John. Sorry that the microphone was off there, but uh, they, they, they mine turquoise in our in yeah, um, uh, I believe you tried to pack you with, with the green mountains in there, and that's where they used to get the lot of the turquoise from that area. Any any other questions for Nora? Any other questions chain migration? We have a gentleman. Not so much a question as a comment. Um, you, you think of chain, chain migration, and you mentioned passing grain in, in New Zealand. I've, I've recently finished reading a book called Banished Kingdoms by Patrick O'Farrell, which okay, yeah. many Patrick. years was the most eminent, eminent yeah. of the Irish Australian in New Zealand. Well, his O'Farrell father came from Boris O'Kane. That's right. His mother from Sullivan here in North Tip, and this is his in Henry, year 1916. And with a whole group of siblings of both families, and it gives a great insight into the religion, politics, birth, baubles, aspirations, and all the rest of it. So, and it was published about 1990. So, if people want to get a flavour of what it was like from the Irish who went from Tipperary to New Zealand in the early part of the last century, I highly recommend to practice our thorough book, Family Kingdom. Yeah. He's an excellent um, author. I've written, read a lot of his stuff. Yeah, brilliant. Good. Any, any other questions? No, we, we did have, you, you had experienced chain migration in your family as well, did you? Well, that's what I asked Brian. Did you call us chain migration? Mm -hmm. yeah. And how did it happen? It was mainly in the 50s, 60s, 70s. In 1848, the first one came out, there was number three in the family. Then the eldest son and the second son came out together. Then the fifth son came out uh, six months later. Uh, another one came out in 1852, and the old parents, about 64 and 68, brought the two youngest children, which were in their late teens, uh, out in 1853. So over the period 1848 to 1853, there were the parents and seven sons came to Australia from Ireland. I think it's just interesting there, um, Brian and myself were speaking there the other day, and uh, our Gleasons were in the Eureka Stockade, and so were Brian, so they may have known each other. I think one of the other interesting things about chain migration is it, it didn't just stick with one generation. It actually went on to the next generation, and then the generation after that as well. Was that a very common thing to see, the whole generations coming out over time? Well, you have to think of the land question. The farm was only going to support one person, so if there were four separate sons and three separate daughters, what were they going to do? So if initially the first ones went, and of course if they made some money, they sent home some money for the others to come out. And you will see that in a lot of families where one son farms. And even last night with Dermot Leeson's um, um, lecture with Denny, you will see that John moved into Nina and married well off the Flannery lady. And obviously his brother probably stayed on the farm. I found the same thing in my family as well because we have uh, letters from the 1940s from New York City from great aunt Nora, who was so great she said things like, did you hear what happened to aunt Catherine? The weather here is fine. Mm. We still don't know what happened to aunt Catherine. She was very brief in her letters. But, uh, we traced the Gleasons in New York 
And then, of course, we found that the eldest son had stayed on the land, and they are still on the land in Knocknail, just south of Dolla, to this day. So for those of you that did have chain migration in your family, you may find that the eldest son stayed at home, and he's still living on the same land that the family was living on in the 1850s. So it's well worthwhile going back into that 1850 period, finding out who the eldest son was, and then trying to trace forward in the cancelled books of the valuation office to see who's living there today. And like I say, they go back up to the 1970s. So um, and that's how I found them. Comment here from Jim Ryan. Yeah, just in terms of the motivations of, of some of the people who were emigrated, there's, there's a book 20 years ago about them growing up in the blasts, and the author says they uh, were considering his career, what would be doing, and he's thinking about becoming a, a guard, a policeman. And he says, Will I go to Dublin among the strangers, or will I go to America, where all my family are? Mm. You can imagine that that must have been the, the case of a lot of people who's, who's, a lot of whose family had already emigrated. But, mm. Um, any uh, comment here from Jerry? Bring me the microphone. Uh, Martin's Martin story is a, is a lot more modern than that. Uh, it's from the 1950s. The reason we're in England is because um, the company that, my, that I worked for, my grandfather worked for, Ford Motor Company, actually had a policy. They had a, they had a foundry in the middle of England, Leviton Spa. Family was hot in the summer and just dry right in the winter, so they couldn't find English was working. So they actually employed a policy of feeding money to HR personnel guys to go over to Ireland, sit in the pubs, and listen. My grandfather walked into a pub, started telling the landlord how bad his life was and the money that wasn't there, and five seconds later was approached by the HR guy from Ford who offered him a ticket, a week's wages, and a ticket back if he didn't like it. He came across, took up the job, found he liked it, stayed on, and eventually brought each of the sons across over the next 10 years. And that's why I'm in England. I went off to work for the company. Um, didn't really know that this was true, thought it was a family story, and got talking to the HR department at Leviton Plant, which is where I started, and found it was exactly true. <laughs> they sent him down with lots of money to get back to work. Mm. Mm. Okay. So, what should we speak to in pubs in this area? We had a comment from Dana. Hi, Jane. Well, the point is that the Irish, you went to Australia, did so well. The Virgin went to New Zealand, did not seem to do so well. I used to work in Manchester uh, Sports Service in London, we were administrators, and I was phoned up one day by a taxi, we'd like to come up to England to your port, which is prestigious, and see how you do things there in some of your restrictions. I said, great, and your name is, his name, his name was Robbie Gleeson, and your position, he said, well, I'm Assistant Attorney General New South Wales, or somewhere, I said, oh really, that's very so interesting. Now you've got a colleague I know, uh, and uh, What's his name? He said, well, he's Martin Gleeson. I said, oh, really? <laughs> uh, are you related? He said, no, 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 our families aren't related at all. I said, I bet you are. <laughs> and I didn't know. But um, they had done well. But there were those who went, that I heard of, who went to New Zealand. And somehow they were never heard of. What was the difference? Well, I suppose for the research that I have done, I would have to, I suppose, slightly disagree with you. And from a lot of the um, books that I have read about New Zealand, the majority of people that went to New Zealand, they say, the historians, and say that they did better in New Zealand because there were less people and that there was more land available and that the fact that there, it was a new country that they integrated better. Now, some of the people in Australia did extremely well, but there were some, I suppose, like in all countries that didn't. So I don't have an exact answer for that, but I would have said from any research that I have looked at, the people in New Zealand seem to do very well. And from looking at any of the books that I have read, and from, we have a lot of answer, our cousins over there, from those areas, the people that I have studied, I would have to disagree with that and just say that they did very well in New Zealand. Yeah, yeah, yeah I think so now. 
Yep. Very good. We have a question here from Deirdre. Uh, first of all, thank you so much, Noah, for that presentation. Um, uh, and much of what you said resonated with the experience of our families, um, various families in New Zealand, but with no chain migration um, from our family at all. And our um, great grandfather who came to New Zealand in 1861, he took a third option, and this was not uncommon, um, which was to join the British Army. Yeah. And he came directly to New Zealand then, but none of his family followed, none at all. And we don't have any, except our own family, we don't have any police and other police and relations in New Zealand that we know of or that we're sure of. That's one of the things perhaps might come out of my researches over the next few days. Um, and, but one of the things that happened was uh, uh, when he was discharged by purchase um, from the army in 1863, he married um, another young Irish woman and her family had come for one of the banner schemes, so that was one of the ones you referred to. And then they went directly after they were married, they went to the gold fields um, at 10 from the Coromandel. So again, um, it fits with what Laura's been saying. Just to say that Deirdre visited my office back in 1988, and I'm glad to see her still pursuing your family history. I'm still looking for at least from Tumavara and Clash, Clash. Anybody from Tumavara here in the audience? Yes, but we're not sure, Morris, if it's Clash. We think it's uh, Catherine Isnick, uh from Tumavara because we found the combination, but we're not definite yet. Right. So but we will bring Deirdre to Clash before the weekend is o the week is over. Very good. Mm. Very good. Great. Well, we'll call her an end there. So can I ask you to put your hands together for Laura's wonderful presentation? I think it did, and I think I recorded everything. Good. It's still recording as is, yeah. Stop recording.